Hi guys, welcome back to chapter three. It's time for uh, fundamental interactions and uh, some other interactions as well. well. Let's see what it's about. First of all, we're gonna be dealing with forces that are definitely not constant in this chapter. And that means, for example, the gravitational force, which arises when you have two objects separated by some distance in space. So a typical example would be a planet and a star, or maybe two stars, or perhaps a planet and a spacecraft of some kind, or maybe a planet and an aster excuse me, an asteroid. Um, of course, this force acts between all masses, even a tomato and a bowl, or a, uh, a bird and a tree, but uh, the force, if you consider such small objects with so little mass, this capital G here, the universal gravitational constant, is such a tiny number that the force produced by two relatively tiny objects uh, is so small that it, it is hardly worth taking into account most of the time. In order to produce an appreciable magnitude of force, you need a huge masses like planets and moons and things like that. So most of the time when we're dealing with this force in any practical way, well, at least one of the masses involved will be rather large. Now that's in contrast with the electrostatic force, which, which is the force exerted on one object by another, where both of the objects have some amount of electrical charge, a net charge of some kind. And the charge is measured in a unit called a coulomb. And the unlike the gravitational force, where the masses are always positive numbers, when we're dealing with electrostatic force, the electric charges can be either positive or negative. So we'll spend some time talking about these uh, relationships, but all I want to point out at the moment is the remarkable similarity between the expression for the electrostatic force and the expression for the gravitational force. The r hats represent a vector that goes from the, char the charge or the mass producing the force toward the object that experiences the force. So the r hats tell you which way the force points, essentially. Notice that the gravitational force has a minus sign. And if you think about it, the fact that there's a minus sign there and the masses are always positive means that the gravitational force is always an attractive quantity. The force always points in a direction toward the other mass that's producing the gravitational force. The electrostatic force, on the other hand, if the two charges are equal in sign, either both positive or both negative, it ends up with a positive sign, which means the r hat vector and the force vector point in the same direction, which means that the force on the other object is repulsive. It tends, they tend to repel. On the other hand, if the two charges have opposite sign, that automatically introduces a negative sign in front, which means that the force points in the opposite direction from r hat, and that means the force is attractive. So the electrostatic force is somewhat richer than the gravitational force in that it can be attractive or repulsive depending on the relative sign of the two charges. The other point that's worth noting is that unlike the gravitational force, if I calculate the acceleration on mass two, uh, I would divide the force by mass two and I'd get something that depends only on mass one. So we get an acceleration due to mass one that's independent of the amount of mass in mass two. But with the electrostatic force, if I divide the electrostatic force by mass one, or mass two, excuse me, notice that now the acceleration depends on the relative charge to mass ratio of particle two. So it no longer is independent of the properties of particle two, but it depends on the detailed proportion of charge to mass in particle two. So you don't get fixed amounts of acceleration from an electrostatic force as you do with the gravitational force. A couple of other forces that we are gonna be dealing with are the force of a compressed or stretched spring, which was introduced in chapter two, but we're gonna be working with it in more detail in terms of uh, predictions of motion this week. And uh, then there's also the force of air resistance, which we sort of touched on last time when we did the uh, 
coffee filter modeling lab, but uh, we'll talk about this in more detail this week and get some sense of how that works. It is a velocity dependent force as opposed to um, a configuration or position dependent force. All right, so how do we handle problems where the force is not constant? Because all four of these examples generally arise uh, in such a way that the forces do not remain constant. And the answer is we, uh, we start with a particle moving with some momentum. We compute the force acting on the particle. Then from the force and the amount of time that's going to elapse, we calculate the change in the momentum using the momentum principle. Given the change in momentum and the original momentum, we can easily add the two together to get the new momentum. Once we have the new momentum, we can uh, compute the velocity of the particle, the new velocity. If we have the old velocity and the new velocity, we can get the average velocity and then extrapolate the motion of the particle to get the new position of the particle. Now, oftentimes, it's going to turn out, especially when the time step is small, that it's not worth the trouble of computing the average velocity, but it's almost is accurate to just use the new momentum to get the new velocity and use that in the position update formula to get the new position. So that's what I'm going to show here on the slide. Once we get the new position, we can use the new momentum and the new force. Notice the new force at the new location is different because the force may depend on location, it may depend on velocity, but it's certainly not going to be constant. So we get the new force, we get a new change in momentum, we add the change in momentum to the old momentum to get the new momentum. And again, we compute the new velocity, extrapolate the position of the particle to the new location. And we basically repeat this process over and over again until, we, uh, until we're happy. We can adjust the time step in order to ensure accurate predictions. And we can let the computer do most of the work in order to compute what happens to the particle. So that's the basic idea. Let's, uh, let's do an example to see how this works. I want to study the example of the motion of a block resting on a spring where the spring is, starts out compressed and so the block is going to end up wiggling up and down. Um, let's talk about the forces that are going to act. We'll have the weight on the block due to the earth. So it's the force on the block by the earth. And uh, we already know from the last chapter that that's proportional to the mass of the block, and the proportionality has to do with the strength of the gravitational field, this gravitational field vector g. Then uh, we've got the force on the block by the spring, which is proportional to the displacement of the block from its, the displacement of the end of the spring, I should say, from its equilibrium or unstretched uh, position. And, uh, and that goes like minus the spring constant times the, times the distance of the spring, the end of the spring from its unstretched place. And we add those two together and we get the net force. And we're gonna just calculate the net force over and over again as the block moves up and down to calculate uh, where it goes. And central to this are the update principles for momentum and position. And if you were, uh, hopefully you were there the other day when we did the modeling experiment with the coffee filters. But the basic code looks something like this. The net force we compute by calculating the displacement of the end of the spring from its equilibrium position or its unstretched position and uh, multiply by the spring constant. And then we add to that the weight. The weight is just the mass of the block times the gravitational field strength. And then um, we update the momentum, recalculate the velocity, that's the momentum divided by the mass because the speed is slow, and then update the position. And I just want to point out that you can replace the, you don't actually have to compute the final velocity, you can simply uh, compute the updated position as the momentum times the change in time divided by the mass. So that's exactly the same thing, I just skipped having to independently compute the velocity since we don't actually need it generally. All right, let's look at some code and see how this works. 
Okay guys, let's look at this code for the spring. Um, I will post this code on ACE so you can take a look at it and you can download it and play with it if you want to. Basically, uh, we set up the relax length of the spring and the initial length of the spring. So it's initially compressed, about 10 centimeters. And then we, we're going to make the mass uh, something like 1 eighth of the unstretched length of the string. A spring, excuse me, so that it, you can see it on the screen. Then we have a time step of a hundredth of a second. We're going to have a spring constant of 8 newtons per meter, and initially we'll have a mass of 60 grams, or 0.06 kilograms. G, of course, is the gravitational field. Start the time at zero. So here we make a display that's a, a square, 600 by 600 display, with the title mass on spring with force arrow. The spring itself is a helix. You don't have to worry too much about that. The block is a box. The force arrow is a green, going to make it a green arrow. And initially, it's going to be, um, let's see, it looks like it's going to be at the uh, center of the box, but over to the right of the box by twice the size of the box. We'll start the momentum out as a zero vector, and we'll start r as a vector at the initial position of the block. Then the uh, equilibrium position of the end of the spring is going to be uh, the spring position plus the length of the spring. Notice that the spring, uh, let's see, it starts at minus the length of the spring over 2, and it has a uh, initial length L minus half the size of the block, but its unstretched length is L0. Then we compute the stretch. What's the stretch? Well, it's the position of the block minus the equilibrium position of the spring it, with no block. And the net force, of course, is minus the spring constant times the stretch plus the weight of the block. Then uh, we're going to uh, calculate the axis of the arrow by simply taking the force divided by 4. And that just scales the force arrow so that it looks nice on the screen. It's uh, obviously the arrow is going to appear in real space on the screen and we need to scale the size of the force arrow so that it fits on the screen nicely and uh, let's see we'll have the hang on one second here gotta move stuff around just a little bit okay so um, and also the force arrow is going to be located in the y direction at the same height as the block, so it'll move along with the block. We're going to wait for a click from the mouse, and then we're going to run the thing 100 uh, frames a second, and look, the physics is all right here. So the physics is update the momentum using the momentum principle, then update the position using the position update formula. Remember from the slides that the velocity is the momentum divided by the mass, so this is nothing other than r plus velocity times dt. That's the physics right there. And uh, here we're going to up update the position of the block on the screen with the new r, and then update the spring so that it looks right on the screen by resetting its axis. And then uh, what are we going to do down here? We have to recompute the stretch and recompute the net force so it's ready for the next time step. So the stretch is the position minus the equilibrium position of the spring. The net force is exactly the same expression that it was before, minus the spring constant times the stretch plus the weight. And here we're updating the arrow, the force arrow, its position and its length to, uh, to reflect the new force and the new position of the block. So uh, let's run this thing. You get an idea what it looks like. And I'm going to move the window here just a little bit so it looks right in the movie. And we're going to go. Notice it goes quite fast. We're going to find out later how to predict how fast the thing goes. But that's a little too fast to see. So what I'm going to do, just to show you how you do this kind of thing, I'm going to dial down the time step just a little bit. Uh, let's make it 0.2, five times smaller. And we'll run it again. And then you'll see that uh, you can kind of see what's going on here is as the block goes above and below its, uh, its equilibrium position, the net force gets bigger and smaller.
and of course changes the momentum of the block according to the momentum principle and the thing wiggles up and down about like you'd expect so that's uh that's the way it works that wh what are the main points of all this the main point is that you break the uh, time up into little chunks of time step here two thousandths of a second every two thousandths of a second we reevaluate the force we reevaluate the velocity and update the momentum and the position according to the update formulas that we learned in chapter two so that's the idea of that one great okay now let's talk about that gravitational force in a little more detail we have an expression for the gravitational force but how does that actually work let's say we have a particle m1 located at r1 and a particle m2 located at r2 so we have a position vector r1 and a position vector r2 we want to compute the force on mass 2 so the first thing we do is to calculate the position of mass 2 relative to mass 1 and that's simply r2 minus r1 right get a unit vector that points in that direction that vector is called r hat then the force we compute by simply plugging in the numbers for the two masses the magnitude of the r21 vector that's the position of mass 2 relative to mass 1 that magnitude goes in the denominator squared and then we multiply the whole thing by r hat and then the universal constant uh, negative g okay the next uh, force we need to discuss is the electrostatic force. It's uh, very similar. We have a charge at R1. We have a charge at R2. We calculate the relative position of charge 2 relative to charge 1. Compute the length of that vector and get a unit vector. And then plug numbers in to calculate the force. That's the idea. Uh, in this example, I've assumed that Q1 and Q2 have opposite charge, but of course, if they have the same charge, then the R hat and the force vector will point in the same direction. And that's all there is to it. Pretty straightforward. Let's, uh, let's look at a demo of a gravitational force acting on two stars as they orbit one another. Okay, guys, I wanted to uh, go over a little code here having to do with the gravitational force between two objects. So... Uh, again, we have a display. It's 800 by 800. I'm going to define an AU as the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and then we'll use AUs in our program as a distance unit. The mass of the Sun, of course, is a solar mass. The gravitational constant you're familiar with, and I'm going to use for the T, the capital T, is a year. That's the time it takes our Sun to go around once. It's approximately pi times 10 to the 7 in seconds. Then we're going to make a couple of spheres to represent the two stars. Uh, one will be red and one will be yellow. Now, these spheres are going to be huge compared to the actual size of our sun, so we can see them in the, uh, in the scene. I'll start one out at plus 1 AU in the y direction and the other at minus 1 AU in the y direction. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll make one star have the mass of our sun, and the other star will be half the mass of our sun, so that the orbit is more interesting. If we made them both the same mass, then they would both be circular orbits, which would, which would nothing wrong with that, but um, this, is, this is more fun. And uh, we'll start the time out at zero. I'm going to start the initial velocity out at 2 pi times 1 AU divided by T. That's uh, the distance the sun goes in one year divided by the time it takes to go around, so that's a reasonable initial velocity. And we'll make the time step a thousandth of a year. The uh, <coughs> F naught is going to be a constant, which is um, basically G times M1 times M2 over 1 AU squared. And I only wanted to calculate that in order to develop a scale that would be reasonable to use to represent forces. So uh, then we'll go on. We'll set the initial momentum of the first star up. And then the momentum of the second star, I'm going to set equal to the negative of the momentum of the first star. And the reason for that, of course, is so the total momentum of the two stars is zero. That means that the center of mass of the star system is going to be stationary. 
So, and we can, we can talk about that more in class. Uh, then we'll go ahead and create a couple of curve objects to follow these guys. And what's the main point? The main point is that uh, the physics is all done down in the loop here. R is the R vector from star 2 to star 1. So star 1's position minus star 2's position. R hat you can get by getting the norm of R. Norm is just a function in v Visual Python that calculates unit vectors. And the force is exactly what we used in class. It's the gravitational constant times the product of the masses divided by the magnitude of R squared. You get a minus sign out here that makes the force attractive. And of course, R hat is the unit vector that points in the R direction. Here's the momentum principle. The star one's momentum is incremented. Plus equals is a way to increment by so much. It's incremented by an amount f times dt. Star 2's momentum is decremented by the same amount because of the reciprocity principle. Um, the force on star 1 is plus f. The force on star 2 by reciprocity is minus f. So we don't have to separately calculate the force on star 2. We know it's just going to be the same thing except with an r hat vector that points in the opposite direction. So we can just use minus equals. And then we increment the star 1 and star 2's position vector with the corresponding momentum times dt divided by the corresponding mass. So this is the same position. So we got momentum update. We got position update. Then um, we update the force vectors in the 3D image. And then uh, and the force position of the force vectors and the axis or length of the force vectors. Then we're going to add to the curve objects which show us the orbit and then start the whole thing over again. So the basic layout of the loop is calculate relative position, calculate force, momentum principle, position update, and then update the force vectors. And that's all there is to it. So let's, uh, let's run this code so you guys can see what it looks like. There go the two stars. Notice because their masses aren't equal, um, the, the, uh, the orbits are not circular. But uh, you can see that the two stars are uh, rapidly moving when they get close together, and they slow down when they're far apart. And the force vectors always point at each other. So the two force vectors are always attractive, and, uh, and that's the way it works. All right. All right. The last thing I want to say before I sign off for today is that uh, there is this idea called reciprocity. And you notice that the equations for the force of gravity between the force of gravitational attraction between two objects is uh, symmetric. In other words, the force on object one due to object two is equal and opposite to the force on object two due to object one. And that's also true for the electrostatic force. And it's generally true that if one object ex exerts a force on another object that there's an equal and opposite force of the first object acting on the former. And uh, that's called Newton's third law. And uh, your textbook calls it the principle of reciprocity. I, th I like the title or the name reciprocity because it gives you some sense of what it means, whereas Newton's third law doesn't tell you anything about what it means. It's just a label. But the reciprocity means that there's a reciprocal relationship between any two forces, that when one object exerts a force on another, there's a reciprocal or uh, equal and opposite force acting back on the first object. And uh, we're going to hit this over and over again. I'll do some demos in class of big trucks colliding with little cars and things like that. And hopefully you guys will come to believe that it not only do you understand the principle, but you'll actually believe that it's true. All right, we'll see you guys next time.